All right, and in today's video, we're talking all about saturation, and we're gonna try to explain a rather technical topic here in a nice, simple way. And in the next video, we'll get deeper into actually applying saturation. But today, what we're gonna cover is, one, what actually is saturation? And two, what are the different types of saturation? And three, why do we use saturation? And we're gonna be using the plugin GSAT Plus by TB Pro Audio. A GSAT Plus is a free saturator and it's outstanding and it has a lot of great features. So we're gonna go over all that today. And by the end of this video, you'll have a great foundation and understanding of the concepts of saturation. So let's get right into it. So what exactly is saturation? Now, technically speaking, saturation is distortion and distortion is saturation. Now, in terms of mixing, what we normally think of with saturation is a much more subtle version of distortion. And it's applied in a much more nuanced way and it gives you a lot of great results on a waveform that you cannot get from EQ or compression or anything else. So there's two main functions to how a saturator is actually working. Number one, saturation is adding harmonic overtone content into the waveform that was not there before. And secondly, saturation does effectively compress a signal. And it technically has the capability of acting as upward and downward compression, meaning that the valleys in a signal can be boosted and the peaks clipped or trimmed off. So saturation not only adds harmonic content into the signal, it can also compress it. So a great place to start with that is going to be doing a quick review on what the harmonic overtone series is. So let's take a look at that. So here is the waveform of a middle C note on a piano. Now let's take a look at this middle C note in a spectrum analyzer. Where the mouse is in the crosshairs, this is called the fundamental. All of these other peaks coming up higher up the spectrum, these are considered harmonic overtones. And if you've never nerded out on the harmonic overtone series, I highly recommend it because it's very useful stuff for an engineer to know. But this is the basic concept is any given note or tone or sound has its fundamental, which is the frequency that it's actually playing. And then all of these other peaks are considered harmonic overtones. And when you get really high up into the frequency spectrum here of the overtones, this is timbre. Timbre is the uniqueness of the harmonic overtone series in the upper frequency spectrum. And this is what's telling the human ear that this C note is coming from a piano as opposed to from a bass or a guitar or a car horn or a pigeon or whatever. When you get up into these high frequencies, the saturation that you're adding up here is actually changing timbre. A sine wave is one of the best ways to conceptualize this. And the sine wave has zero harmonic overtone content. Now on the left here is GSAP. And one of the coolest features about GSAP is that you have control over what are called odd and even harmonics. And that's what we're gonna show right now visually so you can get an understanding of what the difference is. Now, when you saw the harmonic overtones on the piano, what you were seeing is what you find normally in nature, which you'll find with any instrument and anything basically that's not a contrived wave like a sine wave, is you're gonna have a combination of odd and even harmonic overtones. So I'm gonna demonstrate for you now so you can see odd and even harmonic overtones and we'll explain them. And as the sine wave distorts, look at all the harmonics that pop up. There's your harmonic overtone series that came to life. So take the clipping off and let's go back down to strictly our fundamental. Now we're gonna increase the even harmonics and I'm gonna show you on the spectrum analyzer what that means. So this is a 100 Hertz sine wave and you can see the even harmonics when they popped up. They pop up as octaves. And the cool thing about even harmonics is they're always in key. Odd harmonics can potentially be out of key. Now, let's turn up some odd harmonics. 
and you'll see that the first one above 100 happens at 300 and then 500 and then 700 and on up the spectrum. So some of these are going to be in frequencies that are slightly out of key from the original fundamental. This is the difference between even and odd harmonics. Even will always be in key. Odd harmonics, some of them will be out of key. That doesn't necessarily mean that they sound bad, but they have a potential to sound very bad. So you have to be careful with odd harmonics. Now, if we take out the odd harmonics and just increase the even harmonics, you can hear the difference. All of these are technically in key with the fundamental. Now, the other property of saturation, besides just adding harmonic overtone content into the signal, is the compression factor. Let's take a listen to this saxophone without the saturation. And now we're gonna saturate the saxophone, and we're using a whole bunch of odd and even harmonics here. Down here at the bottom in the white, you'll see the waveform of the saxophone. This was before saturation. Now this is after saturation. Before, after. And you can see how that looks just like I really hit that saxophone with a compressor. But the only difference there in that waveform is the saturation. Not only has all of the low information increased, the peak information has decreased. So those are the two functions of what a saturator is. It adds harmonic content overtone into the signal that was not there before, and it does it with even and or odd harmonics, depending on how you saturate. And the nature of the saturation, increasing the valleys and decreasing the peaks, effectively compresses the signal. But here's the catch. Saturators are not adding harmonic overtone content in a linear fashion. Saturation is a non-linear application of signal processing. And what does that mean? It means that if you simply turn up the saturator, it gets seemingly random and unpredictably chaotic. You know, EQ is linear, meaning that if I give a 3 dB boost to 1K and then I increase it to 4 dB, 5 dB, 6 dB boost, I'm going to get a linear result. It's very predictable. I know what's going to happen. And same thing with a compressor. If I engage the threshold with a ratio of 3 to 1, and then I increase the ratio to 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 6 to 1, I get a linear result. I know what's going to happen. Saturators are not that way. You can increase a saturator and you're getting a warm, fuzzy feeling and you're liking the tone that you're getting and you increase it a little more and everything can go sideways on you. And you could be sitting there like, wow, what just happened? I turned the saturator up and I didn't get more of that goodness that I was getting. Things completely changed, but none of it was predictable. It actually is predictable because it's not random. It's just that the science behind saturation is very technical. Saturators are nonlinear, which means that they're a little bit more nuanced than how we go about using them. So let's hop back into the sine wave and show you that nonlinear principle so you can get a visual on it, so you have a better idea of what's going on when you saturate something. All right, so we're saturating our sine wave again. Now let's turn up the odd harmonics and watch the graph. So you can see how certain harmonics increased and other harmonics decreased. Let me do that again. Let me roll that back off and back up. Now let's increase the even harmonics. Did you see how some of the odd harmonics dipped away when that happened? Let me decrease the even harmonics. The point here is, is that these odd and even harmonics have an interplay. This is not a static or linear thing that's happening here. Let me crank them both up again all the way. And let's engage this clipper a little more and start to shave off the tops of those waves and watch what happens to the harmonics. Isn't that fascinating? I find that fascinating. This may seem like a very strange phenomenon here that's going on, but this is why saturators can be difficult and tricky to work with, because the results are seemingly unpredictable. 
Right here, this is the big takeaway from this video, and the reason I wanted to approach this topic from this angle is that gentle saturation is relatively easy to achieve and it's awesome and it will take your mixes to the next level, no doubt. But if you're after oversaturation, it can get really ugly really fast because of this phenomenon that you're looking at right here. So in the next video, we're gonna get into techniques to achieve oversaturation without it all going sideways on you and getting really ugly and harsh. But do not be discouraged about using saturation just because it's complex and technical. Definitely get yourself some saturators and use it in your mixes. If you like what you're getting, run with it. If you don't like it, keep tweaking. Try a different type of saturation, try less odd harmonics, go a different route. But just know that just because you hear something saturating doesn't necessarily mean it's good. So trust your ears. But there you go, that's what saturation is. It's adding harmonic overtone content, it's compressing, and it's doing it in a nonlinear fashion. And as far as the different types of saturation, the most common are tubes and tape. There's a lot of different saturators on the market out there, and there's lots of great plugins out there for you to play around with, but tubes and tape do have their classic places. Most mixes are using some form of tube here and there and tape here and there, but every saturator, whether it's a tube or a tape or whatever, they all have their own unique characteristics. And that has to do with the analog gear emulation itself. Just because you're emulating a tube, that is not the end result of the character of the saturation. Most of the saturation is coming from the transformer and all of the circuitry that was in that piece of tube hardware. It's not just the tube that's doing the saturation. The circuitry is super important. So don't be overly concerned with the type of saturation. I think you will find that you prefer tubes in certain applications and you prefer tape in other applications. That's very common, but it's not exclusive. So don't be hard stuck on using tape only for this and tube only for that. Not all tubes are the same and not all tapes are the same. So don't rule anything out and don't go into it with any preconceived notions. All of those rules are completely there to be broken because the saturation is only as good as the plug-in and the person turning the knobs. Now, why do we actually use saturation? Well, back in the day, saturation was happening naturally because of the nature of the analog gear. Tubes and tape had a natural way of doing gentle distortion that sounds really pleasant. And it added a gentle compression, which is really useful from an engineering standpoint. And now in the modern era, there's a lot of great analog emulation plugins out there to try to capture that analog saturation in the digital world. But that's why we use saturation. We're emulating the analog characteristics of the gear to give us a nice warm and fuzzy and slightly distorted effect on the sounds that are super pleasing and enjoyable. But we also use it to fill out the waveforms. Now, just like you saw with the saxophone, we oversaturated the saxophone, which did compress it heavily, but did you actually like the sound or was it just oversaturated? <laughs> Yeah, that was too much of a good thing. But saturation done correctly and subtly is awesome. Most professional mixes that you hear have all kinds of gentle, subtle saturation going on. And the instruments and the voices that you're hearing in the mix that are being saturated do not necessarily sound distorted at all. So little valleys and little holes can actually be filled up with new, sweet sounding, warm, fuzzy sounding harmonic content. However, once you turn up the saturator too far, not only do you get too much distortion in response to whatever the highest amplitude frequencies are, which is typically the lower frequencies, you also start to get that apparent randomness and chaoticness going on with the artifacts and the strange things happening in your saturation because it's a nonlinear process. But there you go, I wanted to lay out all the basic concepts for you and hopefully that sheds some light on what you can expect when you start saturating things. So stay tuned for the next video where we're actually gonna show some techniques for how to saturate things and avoid those pitfalls of overreacting to certain frequencies and how to dial in our even and odd harmonics depending on the application. And I made this video today in response to a comment that asked me to tackle the saturation topic, and I really appreciate that question. Saturation is a big technical topic, so I'm gonna make several videos on this, and I'm gonna try to break it down so it's simple and you can just understand it on a conceptual level. So thanks again for that comment, and please leave any other comments down there and hit me up with any other topics you want me to cover, and I'll see you on the next one.